Well, for more now on the nuclear disaster looming in Japan, Helen Caldicott joins us from Montreal, Canada. She's the author of this book, Nuclear Power is Not the Answer. Hey there, Helen. I wanted to get your take on uh, exactly what's going on. It seems that every new report, every update we get out of Japan from that nuclear plant there seems to get worse and worse. What is your take on what's happening here? Well, I think the accident, in a way, is only just beginning. That, that's the problem. Uh, six of the reactors are in trouble. One apparently has no water on its rods at all. Uh, two of the cooling pools, or three, are in trouble. One has no water. And that means that as the rods heat up, uh, the zirconium cladding of the rods will ignite mixing with air, burning, and that will allow the rods to fall down to the bottom, coagulate, and melt into a molten mass, and that will release huge amounts of radioactive material into the air, into the troposphere to be carried by the winds uh, either towards Japan to the south or to the east by the wind. Now certainly those w working on this are, are really working day by day, moment by moment, really just trying to, to cool these reactors down. But there's starting to come uh, some solutions or proposed solutions for the future. And I know one of them uh, is the idea of, you know, burying this nuclear plant in concrete and sand. Have you heard about this? Yes, in terming it. What, it's what they did at Chernobyl, but it didn't stop the most enormous release of radiation from Chernobyl. Uh, the New York Academy of Sciences has just come out with a report translating 5,000 papers in Russian into English, and up to a million people have already died from Chernobyl. And that's just the beginning, because strontium lasts for 600 years, cesium-137 lasts for 600 years, plutonium lasts for half a million years, and they bioconcentrate by orders of magnitude in the food chain. 40% of European land mass is still radioactive, will be for hundreds of years, and the food grown there is radioactive. So I do not eat European food. Uh -huh. um, obviously, based on the title of your book, Helen, we know your, your position on uh, this, but I know, I think it was back in 2002, a report came out by the United Nations saying a lot of these um, things that happened, these result, re results of Chernobyl were actually um, over-exaggerated. Uh, what's your take on this? I mean, this was a UN report that says a lot of the uh, drama that sort of came out of there wasn't true. The UN has been lying. There is an unholy alliance and agreement between the International Atomic Energy Agency and the World Health Organization going back decades to say that if there is a nuclear accident, the WHO cannot examine it unless the IAEA, which promotes nuclear power, allows them to. So there's been a huge conspiratorial cover-up, the likes of which I have never, ever seen in medical history before. Uh, keeping with this uh, connection to Chernobyl, I know that uh, when that happened, thousands upon thousands of people were brought in to help to deal with that crisis. And it's really interesting when you look what's happening in Japan, I think that number is in the low hundreds. Uh, why so few resources? And do you think that this will be able to, I mean, with so few people, that there will even be a chance of making the situation better? No, there's absolutely no chance. It's too late now. Uh, for the people to go in there and try and help, they're, they're getting such huge doses of radiation. Some of them are now hospitalized with acute radiation illness, and they will be dead within two weeks, dying with their hair falling out, vomiting, and bleeding to death. Uh, it's a very, very disastrous situation. In fact, the Russian army brought in about, I think, a million people that they called liquidators. And they gave these poor fellows buckets and asked them to walk around picking up the spent fuel rods in their bare hands. If you stand next to one spent fuel rod for several seconds, you will get a lethal dose of radiation. Within days, those men turned brown. It's called nuclear tan. Their arms and legs swelled so much they split. Their brains swelled and they developed a taxia like a drunken man, severe headaches seizures and they died within days. They were called liquidators and they got liquidated. Certainly not, a, uh, 
certainly not an optimistic outlook, but uh, we do thank you. This is something that you've spent a lot of time researching and writing about. Helen Caldicott, author of Nuclear Power, is not the answer. While officials claim that both blasts were hydrogen explosions, Professor Christopher Busby, a nuclear energy expert, opines that the blast at Fukushima Daiichi Unit 3 may have been a nuclear fission criticality. Indeed, it's plain to see that the explosion at Unit 3 differs significantly from the explosion at Unit 1, not just in terms of magnitude, but a whole spectrum of features. In this video, we'll examine some of those features. Unit 3 building initially implodes, and from its first seconds, its blast differs from Unit 1's. Its first smoke is pitch black, and while the force of Unit 1's blast is almost entirely lateral, the forces from Unit 3 are almost entirely straight upward, carrying massive debris five times the height of the building. Indicative of extreme temperatures, an apparent ring vortex forms immediately and constrains lateral smoke projection. Fire appears to be sucked up and into the vortex. Ring vortices like this are classic features of nuclear explosions. Indeed, a classical mushroom cloud cap eventually blooms from the blast invariably driven by the same thermal forces. For context, let's compare the Fukushima fission reactor blast with a known test of a nuclear fission weapon. The classic thermally driven downward rotation of mushroom cloud caps is equally apparent in both cases. While all nuclear explosions have these thermally driven characteristics, not all explosions with these characteristics are nuclear. So while the visual evidence may be consistent with Busby's speculation, it is not perfect proof that Unit 3's blast was in fact a fission criticality explosion. Such proof could come from isotope ratio data that TEPCO has yet to release. But one has to wonder, what are the odds that such a massive explosion with distinct nuclear fission characteristics arises from a nuclear fission power plant and isn't a nuclear fission event? 